Hello, thank you for uh, coming to view this uh, recorded presentation, uh, Return to Peppermint Street, the life and works of Grand Rapids author Mindark de Young uh, for the Grand Rapids History Detectives Program. Uh, my name is Adam Oster, and I am the Community Engagement Librarian for the Library of Michigan. Um, this uh, presentation is sponsored by both the Library of Michigan, the Western Michigan Genealogical Society, and the Grand Rapids Public Library. Um, before we begin, um, I just want to take a few moments to talk a little bit about um, the Library of Michigan and what we do uh, as a service for the state. Um, as far as what is the Library of Michigan, it is an institution created by the state of Michigan to collect, preserve, and provide access to the story of the state and to support libraries and their role as essential community anchors. Uh, we have been around since 1828, um, all the way back to Michigan's, Michigan's territorial days. Um, the Library of Michigan serves both state government and the people of Michigan, much as the Library of Congress works at the federal level. Um, you can see in the top right is a picture of the first territorial capital of Michigan, which was also the first home of the state library. Uh, we then transitioned um, from the territorial library to being the state library in 1837, following Michigan's uh, transition to statehood. Uh, at this uh, time, we were uh, located in Detroit, where the uh, initial territorial capital was located. Uh, we then moved to Lansing in 1847, uh, existed in both uh, the second capital as well as the third capital, um, and then moved to numerous other buildings uh, during uh, the decades following the move to Lansing. In 1983, Public Act 540 transitioned us from being uh, the Michigan State Library to the Library of Michigan. And then finally, in 1988, the Michigan Library and Historical Center opens, uh, which is where the home of the Library of Michigan is at, as well as the State Archives and the Michigan Historical Museum. Uh, this is just an interior shot of what the Library of Michigan looks like. Um, you can see uh, a shot down from uh, taking place on the fourth floor, looking down into the atrium of the library, where you can see floors two through four, um, which are primarily the main areas of collections um, that people can use when they come into the Library of Michigan. Uh, as far as many of the different collections that people use when they come to uh, our facility in Lansing, uh, certainly have the Michigan Documents Collection, has everything from annual reports of state government departments, agencies, and commissions, compiled laws and rules, other different joint documents. Um, we also have what we call the Michigan Collection, which is everything from newspapers, periodicals, gazetteers and city directories, plat maps, uh, county and place histories, uh, cemetery transcriptions, uh, published books by Michigan authors, anything that is about Michigan that is privately published is all included within the Michigan collection. Uh, we are also home to the state law library, so we have a very robust law collection. Uh, and we also have a rare book collection that is roughly about 30 to 35,000 items divided up uh, between law, Michigan topics, and other Americana type of items. Uh, we are always on the lookout for different material. Uh, you can look on michigan.gov slash library gift to see the types of things uh, that we accept um, at the Library of Michigan. So getting into our primary topic of who is my Dart DeYoung, um, I always like to talk a little bit about my uh, introduction to him. Uh, the first book of his that I read um, when I was a um, young fourth grader uh, going to the Howard Miller Public Library in Zealand, where I'm from, um, was The Wheel on the School, uh, which was published in 1954, uh, illustrated by Maurice Sendak, um, and won the 1955 Newbery Medal for Children's Literature. Uh, and the book basically takes place uh, in a little Dutch fishing village uh, in the Netherlands, where uh, characters uh, in the form of school children are asking the question of why do storks no longer come to their village and 
as they start asking the, these questions, they um, sort of make it their mission to try and find a way to bring storks back to their uh, fishing village of Shora and what sorts of force uh, helps them put this um, vision in making this dream happen come true. So for me, it was my first introduction to um, an author who I had never heard of before and who I've soon learned to realize was a very um, well-established author uh, in Michigan and award-winning. And you'll learn a little bit more just about his life and experiences and writing uh, as we go along. Uh, as far as Meidert's early life, uh, he was originally born in the Netherlands in a, a small village called Wernham in Friesland uh, in the Netherlands um, in 1906 on March 4. Uh, his father, uh, Ramiren, uh, Ramiren Stiang, um, and then his mother was uh, Shanji David Stiang. Um, and uh, uh, his parents uh, uh, would later have six sons. Uh, the first and last did not survive infancy, but the four who uh, did uh, survive, uh, they're David, uh, Ramirez Jr., who would later become uh uh, known as Raymond, Mindart, who would often uh, go by the nickname of Mick, and then Cornelius or Neil. Um, the family would eventually come to the United States, uh, and um, uh, both uh, Mindart's parents are buried in Fulton Street Cemetery in Grand Rapids. Uh, this is just a picture of that shows where uh, Warnham is in uh the uh, general area of the Netherlands itself and showing the uh, different um, portions of the country and where it'd be located. As you can see, it's up on the more uh, northern uh, tip of the country uh, facing towards the North Sea. And we also have a more modern day looking picture on the bottom here that shows a panoramic shot of what uh, Warnham looks like th uh, today. Now, the family did live in several other villages um, in the, that general area, but primarily they were in uh, Warnham when uh, Mindart was first born um, and lived out the early first years of his life. Uh, they would eventually immigrate to uh, the United States, uh, the SS New Amsterdam, uh, departing from Rotterdam on May 24, 1914, uh, and arriving in New York on June 2, 1914. And the blue arrow on the side, you can see where the family is listed on this manifest for the SS New Amsterdam, as well as a picture of the ship on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, when they uh, came to Grand Rapids, uh, they lived in four different houses within the vicinity of Wealthy Street and Diamond Avenues. Uh, Ramirez, or he would later be, uh, have his name Americanized as Raymond, uh, worked as a mason and carpenter. Uh, the family joined the Dennis Street Christian Reformed Church. Uh, all four boys went to Baldwin Street Christian School. Uh, Ray and Neil stopped going uh, to school after the eighth grade um, and um, were both successful in the construction-related trades. Uh, however, David and Mindart uh, would go on to high school. Uh, as you can see in the picture above, uh, you'll find where um, uh, Mindart is up in the uh, top row, uh, or second to the top row, third from the left. Um, and you can also see on the side of the screen here where there are um, several uh, images of the various uh, houses that the de young family lived in uh, i was able to at least identify three three uh images that that show either where the homes were or um where the uh which homes still uh take place and this um would have been um roughly between 1916 and the early 1920s of the family living in these spots uh first on donald street uh roby place and then on dwight uh, 
following going to the Baldwin uh, Street Christian School, uh, Mindart would attend Grand Rapids Christian High School and graduated in 1924. Uh, he then attended Calvin College. Um, after graduating from Calvin, uh, he reluctantly accepted a position to uh, teach English, rhetoric, Latin, English literature at Grundy College, a junior college and academy in North Central Iowa. Um, but he was only there for a short period of time uh, because he left uh, both because of the school's inability to pay his salary and his belief uh, that he really didn't see himself as, as a teacher. Um, you can also see a picture here from uh, when Mindart graduated from Grand Rapids Christian um, and see his uh, senior picture um, from the, the class yearbook. Uh, he would soon, uh, right after leaving Iowa, return to Grand Rapids, uh, moved in with his parents who were renting a small farm uh, on Richmond Road west, west of Grand Rapids, uh, closer to the Walker area. Uh, to supplement the family's income, Mindart began raising chickens and selling uh, their eggs door to door, which uh, brought two cents more per dozen than when selling the eggs to a dealer. Uh, he also worked as a tinsmith's apprentice, installed and repaired furnaces, uh, was a cemetery laborer, and tried uh, cement work. Um, and in July 6, 1933, he married uh, Hattie. O Overinder. Um, the Overinder family had um, previously been in the Netherlands uh, around the same time as the de Young family, and so they um, that was uh, how uh, Mindart had been introduced to them um, because the families had been somewhat cl uh, close um, while back in the Netherlands. Um, they began their married life on the second floor of the farmhouse on Richmond Road. Uh, Mider continued uh, the egg business while Hat Hattie took in laundry. And you can see on the right side here where um, they're listing in the newspaper of having gotten their uh, marriage license. Uh, as far as the inspiration for Mindart's writing, it started uh, as he was uh, often visiting the Grand Rapids Public Library to sell eggs to the employees, and he would often uh, be telling original stories to many of the patrons that were um, in the children's room at the library, and it ended up being the head of the children's room, uh, Librarian May Quim Quigley, who encouraged uh, him to start writing these stories down and to see what he could do as far as becoming a published author. Uh, his first book, um, uh, which was uh, published in 1938, The Big Goose and the Little White Duck, um, uh, would come out, and uh, we have an interesting little write-up about it uh, that was listed as a review in the Grand Rapids Press. Um, which talks about how it's a simple story, simply told, yet rather unique in the plot, for it has what might be called a plot and a good one. Uh, it then goes and talks a little bit about the synapses of the uh, story itself. Um, and what's interesting is the last paragraph where it says, uh, adults should derive much pleasure from reading it to smaller children who can not read for themselves or from sneaking away from the grown-ups and reading it all by themselves. For it is one of the best of the crop of 1938 children's books, and also pretty good reading for the chap who goes to the circus, merely for the purpose of taking the youngster. So, although it was intended for children, it seemed to be very much a story that uh, could be universally read by uh, most anybody. Uh, just to kind of show an area of where... Uh, Mind Art and his wife moved to. They eventually uh, got a home on Butler Avenue uh, next to Oakdale Park Christian uh, Reformed Church. Uh, and if you do ever go out there, the house is still there on Butler. And this is an image of it right next to the church. Uh, as we're approaching uh, World War II, uh, we have it where um, Mindart had to fill out a draft registration form, and we can learn just a little bit more uh, about uh, uh, about him, just as far as his physical description, and a bit, a bit more about um, himself. Uh, he was 34 years old at the time. 
um, working for himself. Uh, he was five foot seven and a half inches tall, weighed 170 pounds, blue eyes, blonde hair, and had a light complexion. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, Mindart would be uh, drafted into serving into World War II uh, during the summer of 1943. Uh, he would uh, first go to basic training in Texas, was sent to the Jefferson Barracks in Missouri, and then to clerical school in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, he would work as a clerk typist. Uh, he then received orders in 1944 to travel uh, via South America, Africa, and India to South Asia, uh, where he would be joining the headquarters of the Chinese American 68th Composite Wing of the U.S. Army Air Corps, uh, a unique uh, characteristic about the 68th uh, is that it was the command and control organization of the 14th Air Force, which was uh, the successor of the Flying Tigers unit um, that fought in the um, China, Burma, India theater. Uh, he was initially assigned as a wing historian, uh, later became a public relations officer and promoted to sergeant. Uh, while he was stationed, um, at the village of Pishi near Chongqing. Uh, he, along with half of the garrison there, contracted malaria as a result of the perpetual rains and the lack of mosquito netting. Uh, an interesting uh, aspect about his military experiences is that it inspired um, a future book about a Chinese war orphan um, with a family pig that was befriended by American airmen based on the life of a boy adopted by the men of uh, a barracks in the unit that he was serving in. Uh, that book, uh, which was called The House of Sixty Fathers, uh, was published in 1956. Uh, when he was discharged in 1946, he took a job as a church uh, church janitor and then soon returned to uh, writing full time. Uh, getting into just uh, his books and awards, let's just talk a little bit uh, more about those in detail. Uh, he would eventually write 27 total titles so his first one the big goose and the little white duck being uh published like i said earlier in 1938 uh, and he would continue writing all throughout the 1950s and 60s and into the early 1970s uh when it comes to some of his writing themes and style um you'll find that my dark young often draws on personal experiences whether it's his childhood memories of living in the netherlands uh, or at his parents farm in michigan uh, often incorporates animals and children as the primary characters. Uh, a unique sort of quote that um, kind of draws a little bit more into how he gets into writing for children uh, comes from the Newbery Award acceptance speech that he gave uh, in 1955, where he said, to get back to that essence, you can only go down. Uh, you can only go in deep in down through all the deep, mystic, intuitive layers of the subconscious back into your own childhood, and if you go deep enough, get basic enough, become again the child you were, it seems reasonable uh, that by way of the subconscious you have come into what must be the universal child. Then, and then only, do you write for the child. Uh, as far as some read-alikes that are a bit similar, uh, as far as time period and feel um, and similar uh, type of tone, uh, I think Beverly Cleary and with her uh, several of her series and books like uh, the Henry Huggins series, the Ramona, Mouse on the Motorcycle, Dear Mr. Henshaw are somewhat similar to what you would find with Mind Art De Young. Um, other things like Mr. Popper's Penguins by Richard and Florence Atwater, uh, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Little House on the Prairie series, uh, several titles by author E.B. White like Stuart Little, Charlotte's Webb, The Trumpet of the Swan, um, and then also uh, Michigan author Margaret DeAngeli. Uh, many of her works are also um, similar uh, to how um, Mind Art, uh, De Young writes, uh, The Door on the Wall is one of her more well-known ones. Something that's also unique, too, is that um, Maurice Sent Deck was a frequent collaborator with Mind Art, De Young. Uh, the uh, two of them would eventually have 
uh, seven books um, of mind arts that would be illustrated by Maurice Sendak, uh, Shadrach, Hurry Home Candy, The Wheel on the School, The Little Cow and the Turtle, The House of Sixty Fathers, Along Him a Dog, and The Singing Hill, uh, all uh, published in the 1950s and up until the uh, uh, the Singing Hill in 1962. Um, and uh, what Maurice Sendak is most well known for is his uh, writing and illustration for Where the Wild Things Are that was published in 1963. And we have a picture of both him and some of the illustrated characters from Where the Wild Things Are. And if we look at a few of um, the illustrations that uh, he did uh, with Mind Art de Young, you can kind of see. Um, similar commonalities style of illustrations that um, can be seen in many of his other works. So for example, this is some sample illustrations from uh, Shadrach, a story about a boy Davy and his pet rabbit uh, Shadrach. So we have uh, three different pages here that show uh, pencil illustrations um, of many of the characters and figures from the story. Uh, another one, Along Came a Dog, uh, which is a story about the friendship of a little red hen and a homeless dog. Um, and we also have uh, three different pages of illustrations that you can uh, see some of the common styles um, that Maurice and Deck would follow um, that we can also see in comparison with like Where the Wild Things Are and many of his other um, books that he has done illustrations for. Uh, Mind Art Young would have several award-winning titles. Um, we have six in front of us here. Uh, five of them were uh, Newbery, either Newbery Honor Books or Newbery Medal winners. Um, Shadrach was a Newbery Honor Book in 1954, as well as Hurry Home Candy. Uh, the Wheel on the School was a Newbery Medal winner in 1955. Uh, the House of Sixty Fathers was a Newbery Honor book in 1957. Uh, Along Him a Dog was also a Newbery Honor book um, in 1959. And then uh, lastly, Journey from Peppermint Street was the National Book Award in Children's Books uh, in 1969 after its publication in 1968. Um, just a little bit more about uh that particular book. Um, this here is the uh, certificate that my dart received um, after being honored uh, uh, for Journey from Peppermint Street as uh, a National Book Award uh, recipient. And just a little bit uh, about the book itself is that it's set in Holland in the early 1900s and chronicles the occurrences uh, on a young boy's journey to visit an aunt and how those events uh, affect his return journey and arrival at his home in Peppermint Street. And what's really interesting is that Peppermint Street itself is an actual street within Wernham uh, in the Netherlands, where Mind Art Young is from, and we have a picture here of that particular street. So it's another one of those books that, you know, has a uh, harken back to Mind Art's time growing up in the Netherlands. Uh, he would also be honored with the Hans Christian Andersen Award. Um, which are two literary awards given by the International Board on Books for Young People, recognizing one living author and one living illustrator for their lasting contribution to children's literature. Uh, the Writing Award was first given in 1956, uh, and then they started a companion illustration award in award in 1966. It's uh, often sometimes called the Nobel Prize for Children's Literature, and Mind Art Young was the first American to win the award, receiving it in 1962. Um, just to kind of give some numbers in uh, relation to that, there have only been uh, six total winners for writing from the United States and then one for illustration. And the most recent U.S. winner was uh, Jacqueline Woodson in 2020. Uh, an interesting aspect about um, 
when my dark young was being honored for the hans christian anderson award is that uh grand rapids uh created a special week to honor him um and this is uh uh, article in the Grand Rapids Press from uh, August of 1962. And one of the uh, special things that was going on is that many of the businesses and places in downtown Grand Rapids had special displays that were uh, set up to honor either individual titles or uh, mind art uh, himself. So Steckides had a display that was based on the House of Sixty Fathers. Uh, Herpelsheimer's had one that was based on Nobody Plays with a Cabbage. Grand Rapids Public Library had a display um, for the Wheel on the School. And uh, Worsburg's had just a general display um, that was uh, featuring several of My Dark Young's titles and other uh, aspects about him. Um, we can also see here an image from when uh, My Dart and his wife were traveling from the Kent County Airport to head to Germany for him to be honored for the Hans Christian Andersen Award. Uh, and uh, we can also th see the actual certificate um, where it's also uh, available to see uh, as part of the Mind Art Young collection at the Heritage Hall um, within the Heckman Library at Calvin University. And you can see in the article on the right where that same uh, uh, certificate is being featured. And it's really neat to see that this is something that has been preserved as part of a this collection of Mind Art Young material that's at Calvin University. To go a little bit more into his uh, later life, um, several different awards brought increased sales and contracts um, uh, uh, from uh, the Walt Disney Company. So one of the things was that there was a contract to um, potentially make Hurry Home Candy into a TV show. Um, Mind Art would uh, leave Grand Rapids for Mexico. Uh, him and Hattie would uh, get divorced. And then in 1962, uh, Mind Art uh, married uh, Beatrice de Claire McWee, uh, McElwee, uh, a member of a writing class that he taught. Uh, the two of them lived in Mexico for six years uh, and then moved to Chapel Hill, North Carolina in 1968. Uh, his final book, The Almost All-White Rabbity Cat, was published in 1972. Uh, they would then uh, move to Allegan, um, Michigan, after five years in North Carolina, uh, after being sort of homesick for wanting to come back to the United States. Uh, Beatrice died in 1978, and uh, this essentially uh, stopped Mindart from doing any more extensive writing as he considered her his best editor and critic. Uh, Eleven years later, he would marry his good friend, the widowed Gwen Jonkman Zanstra, uh, who he had known uh, since high school. Uh, and then he would die July 16, 1991 um, at Allegan General Hospital following an extended illness, and his remains were cremated. Um, I've never really been able to find if his remains were ever buried anywhere. Um, uh, any of the material that I've been able to locate was just saying that uh, his remains were cremated and nothing else is really known uh, beyond that. Um, on the side here, you can see his obituary from the Grand Rapids Press, um, uh, as well as a photo of uh, Gwen and Mindart uh, that was taken in 1991, um, not long before uh, Mindart would pass away. And a picture of uh, the cover of his final book, The Almost All-White Rabbity Cat, um, like I said, was published in 1972. Um, if there are any questions, um, uh, viewers of this presentation are more than welcome to uh, either uh, add them uh, as a comment to the video recording. Uh, otherwise, um, you're more than welcome to 
send an email or call the Library of Michigan, and I will have uh, that contact information up in just a second here. Uh, as far as many of the uh, sources that I use for uh, content for this presentation, um, utilized uh, Ancestry.com Library Edition um, material from the Grand Rapids Public Library, uh, the Mind Art Young collection that is at Heritage Hall uh, within the Heckman Library at Calvin University, uh, material that is at the Library of Michigan, and then uh, a special um, shout out to um, Richard Arms' uh, write-up on Mind Art Young um, in the Origins that he uh, uh, wrote in 2008, uh, as it was very helpful for finding a lot of the material um, connected to Mind Darty Young, um, as well as uh, other different uh, newspapers material that I was able to find at several of these different libraries. Uh, uh, this is the contact information for the Library of Michigan, so if anybody does have any uh, additional questions, they can email librarian at michigan.gov or call 517-335-1477. Um, I thank you for uh, viewing this presentation and certainly encourage you to uh, check out many of the other videos that are part of the Grand Rapids History Detectives um, and certainly come visit us at the Library of Michigan.